I did have hair at one time. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned, we do a lot of different types of sequencing or uh, uh, genetic analysis. And it's a full service uh, laboratory that does chromosome analysis and microarray analysis and whatnot. Um, so, the, just to give you a little bit of background, the name Fullerton has just come from a philanthropic family that uh, over the years has supported our operations, the Fullerton Foundation. It's based in South Carolina, and they've been very kind. And, and supporting us, and so we named a laboratory after after a while. Um, we have a full staff of clinical geneticists and genetic counselors and cytogeneticists and molecular geneticists, so it's a uh, pretty full operation in that regard. And uh, I personally have had an interest in muscle physiology, and uh, I'm not an uh, electrophysiologist in any uh, stretch of the imagination. My interest is in finding mutations. That's what I do every day. I look at patient samples, look for mutations, and then see if they make sense. So it's been mentioned uh, several times that there's a lot of variation at the DNA level from person to person. That's what makes us different. The vast majority of it doesn't mean anything at all. There's changes in the genetic code that really don't impact health or uh, capacity in any way. But some of it does, and knowing which ones are pathological and which ones are not is a challenge. It's really difficult to do uh, consistently. So that's, we spent a lot of time trying to standardize uh, how we analyze uh, patient samples. So I've had a long-term interest of over 10 years now doing myotonia congenitive testing and pair myotonia congenitive testing, the uh, CLCN1 and SCN4A. We were one of the few labs in the U.S. that were doing it. There are uh, more and more as years ago by and more and more labs that offer this service. But when we started, and I will give a, uh, uh, hand, a uh, endorsement for Janet Stone, who actually made that connection for those of you who know Janet, uh, the same as with uh, Krista. Um, so uh, we have accumulated quite a bit of experience in myotonia congenita and paramyotonia congenita, but not much in periodic paralysis. And so that's what we are looking for now. We opened this facility about a year ago, and that's uh, what uh, Linda's kind of comments uh, was alluding to. So she came up to visit, and we really have a very nice facility, and uh, uh, it's in an ambulatory setting out away from the main hospital campus that includes a number of things. And that's the view out my window about this time last year when we had our first snowstorm, and we had just moved into the building. But that's a children's uh, outpatient center there. There's a neurology outpatient ambulatory center cardiology all in this setting. So we have lots of partners that if we have um, uh, disorders that require specialists of other sorts, we've got them right close at hand. Um, so uh, the reason that I started doing the testing for myotonia congenita about 10 years ago is that we had a local patient. We couldn't find anybody to do the mutation analysis. And um, you may know that it's really important to have a diagnosis. You may have a disorder that has some uh, weakness or stiffness, but there are a number of things that could give rise to that. So having a, uh, whether there's something you can do about it or not, there's a great value in having a diagnosis. And having a molecular confirmed diagnosis is really kind of uh, puts the nail in the coffin in terms of being uh, the final word. Uh, if you've got a history of that particular mutation causing uh, the disorder in multiple people. And so, again, we, we collaborate with a number of people throughout the world to try to uh, tally these patients as they become known. And, and thanks to the, uh, the basic science folks that are doing such fantastic work, it's really made uh, leaps and bounds of progress. It kind of comes and goes, ups and downs, uh, but it's really interesting to see the progress. Um, so, uh, about this time last year, uh, Dr. Lehman Horn uh, had decided to retire and they were trying to think about what to do with their program in Germany and so um, uh, Linda and uh, Dr. Levitt and I had uh, several conversations about could we take over some of that testing. So our goal was to kind of duplicate what they had been doing in Germany, that is screening the calcium channel gene, screening the sodium uh, channel gene, and a couple of the potassium challenges that were associated with the disorders that you've heard about today and uh, 
periodic paralysis in general. Um, and, but these are not full gene uh, investigations. We're just looking at, at the areas, uh, the exons in the genes, these are the portions of the genes that are part of the protein coding region that we know have uh, been found to have mutations in other patients. So we're, it's a screen, not a full investigation. It's important to differentiate that. Uh, and uh, I'd like to come back to this point later, maybe with some questions about uh, some folks have contributed their sample for that study, and they used to, uh, Dr. Lehman Horn's lab was a research lab. Uh, so it was contributed with the understanding uh, of certain parameters, and we would like to live up to that uh, if we possibly can. Uh, and they've transferred their DNA samples to us and transfer the clinical records to us. And for those people who feel like they have a gap in their information and didn't get the feedback, and we've had several conversations today about this, I will do my very best to try to uh, go through those records to try to track down that information for you. Uh, and then I think we could uh, ask them, uh, uh, Dr. Lee and Mormon, Karen, uh, Jurgen uh, wrote that uh, have done some of the work to follow up on that with us. So, so we'll kind of come back to that. Um, so as I mentioned, we were just trying to duplicate uh, what had been done previously, and they were, uh, the group in Germany was very cordial and very happy to uh, pass on this information, and uh, we coordinated it back over the course of the summer, so I'm still going through it. It's quite extensive. They um, sent me about, um, I think there's about 500 DNA samples that they sent me that have been collected over the years, and they are about 15 pages of a spreadsheet uh, of, of folks that I have a little bit of information on and I'll be glad on a case-by-case -case basis to go through those and uh, give you what information I have. And I'll remind you that we try to do it with the strictest uh, confidentiality. So I, uh, we, there, there may be some situations where you have family members that I may not be able to tell you about. But if they will come forward and ask me the same question, I'll be glad to interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we'll kind of, uh, we'll maybe that can be part of our planning as to what to do going forward. So just, we started uh, taking samples back in January, and we've tested about uh, 30 individuals now with this screen. And here are some uh, findings that um, I wanted to share with you just, uh, and, and hopefully this will be some food for thought. Uh, we've had very few positive uh, screens, like 10% of, of the 30. We've really found about three, and there's been some peripheral findings that uh, somebody turned out actually to have myotonia congenita uh, in a couple of cases. So there's some, uh, some, some other positives, but really three true positives out of about 30. So that tells me that uh, the clinical diagnosis is not firm. And I think that's no surprise to some people, but it, it, having a good clinical workup is really a good prelude to doing a good genetic test. Uh, because it tells us that we're focusing on the right things. Um, so I, I have some concerns that the referrals, and I think a few of these referrals are almost self-referrals. In the United States, for a clinical investigation, you have to have a physician refer the test. And uh, it's not, uh, some people are a little confused about the forms that we had that it requires a signature. It just requires that your physician will take the information and give you, uh, uh, we're going to provide a mutation report, and if it's positive, uh, then we need someone that can interact with the patient to explain the complex information. That's basically what it's about. So that's why it's important to have that person. Uh, sometimes the physicians don't know any more than the patients. Actually, just the opposite. The patients may know more than the physicians in some cases. But still, that's the way it has to work here. Um, and so I have concerns that some of the referrals are not clinically appropriate. Uh, and that may skew the numbers a little bit. Uh, and uh, it, as I mentioned, when you have a, um, you may have a negative screen that may rule out the typical periodic paralysis etiology. Uh, and because we're getting so many folks that, uh, that, that don't have a positive, it makes me think there are other genes out there. And I would love to hear feedback from those people who are actually doing frontline research about that. I, uh, 
feel like that there must be something else going on out there that I'm just not comprehending. Um, we have had a number of referrals from older individuals with a permanent weakness, and I think that that's a non-specific diagnosis, and that may be giving rise to some of the problems. Uh, we're happy to investigate. I think it may be step one in actually ruling that out may have a value in going forward. Um, and as I mentioned, I think there's additional gene discovery that can be done. And uh, the other thing that's a little different about the, uh, the operation in Germany versus here is that they were doing it under grant funding, and we do not have any grant funding for doing this. And so we had to institute a charge. I would love not to have to charge for it, but that we charge $500 for doing the screen, and that pretty much covers our overhead. There's no profit there for us. We are looking to provide the service uh, as part of the collaboration. Um, we're ecstatic when we find one. And, uh, you know, just uh, having the ability to uh, provide the assay is really important to us. And so if we can figure out ways to address the cost issue, I would be more than glad uh, to have those discussions. But I think we need to do it as a, as a bigger and better discussion. And um, I guess the last thing I wanted to say just related to that was that uh, if we decide that there's more to it uh, than we currently know about the genes, uh, that maybe different approaches for doing the screening that would include actually more expensive approaches, but actually approaches for doing something that's called whole exomic sequencing. So in our setting, we have a number of patients that come through uh, for a variety of indications. Uh, I'll just pick one. Autism uh, is a good one. We, uh, uh, and this could be anything that's kind of nonspecific and doesn't have a tight diagnosis, is that we may do, we may have a differential gene list of uh, 10 things we want to look at. We first look at the fragile X gene. We look at uh, doing a microarray analysis to see if there's any deletion or du uh, duplication of the genetic material kind of genome-wide. Uh, and then we may have some clinical indications that give us maybe a list of five things, five genes that we know we ought to take a look at because it looks like this patient may have something related. And we'll go through that list and we will, and that, you know, doing those investigations may cost $5,000 by the time we're finished with it, so it's not inexpensive. Uh, and we still may be left with uh, no answer. So one thing that uh, the technology has advanced in the last few years and is becoming more cost effective to just look, to shoot the moon. Let's look at all of the genes or at least a portion of the genes that are clinically relevant. Uh, and I mentioned to you earlier there's about 22 or 23,000 genes, but we don't need to look at all of those uh, in most cases. And we, can, we have something that's called a clinical exome. So exomes are really talking about the protein coding region of the gene. So we've heard people talk about proteins and how they do the work of the cell. Uh, so we're, we're, that's about 1% to 2% of the DNA. So uh, we can focus and, and keep our costs down by uh, looking at these uh, uh, kind of shoot the moon types of things to look at all of the extras. And there may be some value in doing that, especially when you've exhausted all of the possibilities. Uh, so I throw that out there, hoping that uh, there will be some comments related to that, whether that's useful to do or not. Uh, and I want to turn just to a few uh, details to tell you about the ones that we did have positive. So these are, uh, I know you can't read this from the back, but we're, this is the uh, calcium channel gene, and this, these are the known mutations uh, just pulled from the databases that we uh, use to um, tabulate these. Uh, so the, there are uh, not many places in the calcium channel gene that you really have to look at. That's a pretty big gene, but we only look at about 10% of it, uh, or, or yeah, about 10%, I guess, and um, look for the places where known mutations occur. And out of those 30 that I mentioned to you, we found uh, really uh, two individuals, uh, one of which was a known, known, known patient to us already, so it really didn't count. Uh, and one that had uh, kind of the uh, classical mutation that you've heard about already a couple of times today. Um, and uh, so the, the question in my mind is, are we actually screening the right portion of the gene? And I think the answer for the calcium channel gene is yes. Uh, 
there's so few uh, mutations. Uh, there, uh, the, all the mutations that are known to be associated with periodic paralysis fall in these four exons that we check. And there's some uh, case reports out that are a little unusual. That's what I've got comments on the side and column there about some unusual families, and maybe that would be something to take a look at if we had a strong clinical suspicion that someone ought to have a mutation in one of these genes and we weren't finding anything. We may go back and take a look at some of the other exons. This is a similar analysis for um, the sodium channel gene, the SEM4A. Uh, these are just listed mutations that are possibilities there uh, from known patients and known uh, reports. Um, and uh, you can see again there are uh, just two positives there. And these were known classical mutations. Uh, and then we had another incidental finding of another family that we uh, locally uh, knew about already that we screened just to kind of be complete for them. Uh, and then the, the uh, third gene that we take a look at is uh, one of the potassium channel genes. And uh, it's associated with Anderson's well syndrome that you heard uh, earlier about today. Uh, and we, again, had a, uh, a known family here. So we actually had three local families and then three that we ascertained from all the collection that we did uh, for people sending in samples. So we didn't have a lot of positive findings in the first nine months or so. And um, I think that's just, again, just worth discussing and thinking if there are better strategies. We actually analyzed the uh, fourth gene, the KCNJ18 uh, gene that's associated with uh, uh, thyro uh, thyrotoxic periodic paralysis that you have heard a little bit about earlier. And there's it's quite a murky gene to analyze, and so um, I'm not quite sure how uh, strictly we should uh, look at that particular gene just because the, the, this gene is almost identical to another gene and it complicates the analysis. And, I worry that we might overinterpret something that's not really true. Um, so I'm going to stop and just kind of—I really would like to take questions or comments and uh, anything specifically related to the relationship to the lab in Germany and what we're trying to do here. We're still sorting some of it out, and would be happy to uh, address any of your questions. Okay. So the question was, uh, if um, someone decided to proceed with a, a whole exome or even a whole genome, that's another test that I didn't tell you about, would there be enough DNA typically? And I will say that yeah, this, from the samples that have already been collected and that we have thanked in our laboratory. And the answer is probably yes. There's, I, I've looked at most of those samples, and but not every single one of them just to check the volumes, and most of them have a lot of DNA there. You know, a regular blood sample of DNA gives you tremendous amounts to do work with. So there should be, in many cases, enough DNA to do that. And if you opted to do that, we actually don't offer the testing yet. We're getting ready to offer it, but there are other labs that we'd be happy to coordinate with and send it to, um, and coordinate with, with you or whoever wants to uh, test okay. it. There is at least one more gene for hypokalemic periodic paralysis. It's uh, a, a variant that Dr. Lehman Horn and I have uh, uh, referred to as hypokalemic periodic paralysis plus or hypopd plus. And uh, the people who have this uh, have either ADHD or PMS plus uh, uh, lidocaine hardly works for them. And uh, uh, we're trying to figure out what the gene is, but it's, it's not, it does not appear to be either the calcium channel or the sodium channel gene. So there is definitely another gene in the mix. I okay. don't really know what the total, the, the figures that are usually given is that 70% of people have either the sodium or calcium channel gene, but I, I don't know how solid that figure is because we may be missing other people. So, so the numbers, so, so people who, for whom no gene has been found uh, should not think they don't necessarily have it. We're still at an early stage and we can't, uh, we 
know there's at least one more gene out there, and there may be more than that. Uh -huh. And if I may just comment on the last comment in terms of whole genome or whole exome. Uh, uh, so if you just have one person, the, uh, those are good techniques for looking at genes that are known to be clinically involved. They're not good techniques for looking uh, for with one person for looking for a new gene. For that, you need a whole family. You need to go tracing things. And for uh, dominant conditions, you need to have some more distant relatives because you share 50% of your dominant genes with your uh, with uh, any members of your relatives. So depending on what's going on, you, you may need to have larger families, uh, but the whole exome uh, technique is actually is very good for just looking at a lot of genes where you know what you're looking for. But uh, it, uh, the point, point well taken about that. We typically would do uh, an exome analysis under the best of conditions with a trio with uh, parents and uh, a proband, an effective person. Uh, because we do find a lot of variants that uh, uh, having the parent as a uh, parent samples as a uh, check to see how significant that is, is is a meaningful exercise. So we would do that, um, or typically would want to do that. We may not be able to do it in some circumstances. Um, and I, I guess I would. Uh, I'm very interested in thinking about expanding what we're already screening for. So uh, having the, the new genes that are coming along and, uh, and mutation analysis and uh, expanding what we're looking at will really be helpful. I have a question about um, the hip hop study. I'm here. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, did the, did every test with the hip hop study go to this laboratory that you know you don't have? No. The, uh, you're. you're there are other laboratories that do the testing. Uh, there's nothing that says you need to send it to us. Uh, but if it was done already, I participated in 2010, and I, I don't know which lab did it, and I'm trying to get my results. Okay. And so um, I guess that was one, part one of the question. And part two is, is there a difference now, any changes from 2010, why we should have it redone? Um, I think the answer to your last question is uh, possibly, but probably, I think they were probably doing the same thing for a number of years in terms of what they were screening. Uh, it's a little unclear to me in some, in every single family that was tested that they did exactly that. So I'm, I'm literally going back through these kind of one by one. Uh, and I think um, at least for the calcium channel, the sodium channel, and probably the potassium J2 gene uh, that they have been done for quite a while, probably five years or more. Um, uh, I may have to eat those words when I actually go through all of them, but I um, think those have been done. Well, well, I would say with the hip hop study, I think uh, Dr. Griggs had his own lab uh, at Rochester, and I, there was a, I, I, I don't know exactly, but I think there was a more limited extent of what he was screening for to get inclusion criteria into the study. Uh, whereas um, Dr. Lehmanhorn had a very broad uh, approach to screening to try to hit as many targets as possible. That's what Fullerton Lab ad adopted. So to my knowledge, Fullerton's lab is the, the most kind of compulsive screening that you could get for your, you know, for your buck. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I was in the hip hop study, and I have my report, if you want to see it, but it, the, I don't know specifically, but it says at the top that it was uh, London that it was sent to, and they only tested two specific regions, the CACNA, or 1S, and the SCN4A, so that was something I was going to ask about. Okay. Well, that um, maybe, uh, I just didn't know the details yeah, yeah, of that right. particular, uh, so that's actually very helpful to me to know. I have what was done in Dr. Lehman Horn's lab, not the other. So we know Yes. Yep. Now I think we just gonna we're gonna do it on a case by case, and um, I'll be glad to do it by email, and you know we can communicate and get it done. And I've had several people ask me uh, today about the same thing. One question. You have only 10% of positive results, okay? 
Say again, please. You have only three cases with positive yes. results. Okay. But you show a list for the uh, calcium channel, many patients. Those were from Germany or? Those are just the ones from the literature that have been found in, a, in previous patients. Oh, I see. So those are, if you go to the mutational databases, those are the ones that are listed uh, associated with periodic problems. And uh, how many cases have you seen in the United Hospital? How many cases more or less? Uh, which one? Oh, calcium channel. Oh, uh, well, we've only seen one, and we actually had another patient that we had already identified that actually ran through the screen, so we uh, counted that as an incidental one. Uh, so really only one out of that group of 30. So these are the ones that have, we've received in the last few months. So this is kind of once they transition, once the work stopped in the German lab, we tried to pick it up. And that's what that's all that we have done in the, about nine months now. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, the German lab did mine about uh, six years ago. Didn't find anything. Uh, Dr. Lehman Horn sent me a note saying he had went through it twice. So my question would be, should I do it a second time or should I have another draw now and, and see if there's any changes or different results? You know, um, your DNA is not going to change. <laughs> so I feel uh, great confidence in the analysis that they did. They're very thorough and um, detail-oriented. So if, if something was there in the original result, I feel comfortable that they would have detected it. So the next question is, if you don't, if you're not finding a mutation in the, the known places, are there other places? And uh, you know, one, of the, one of the comments was related to a, a new gene. And so maybe we should expand our current one. And so the answer today, Maybe if we added that, then yes, we probably should take a look at this if we think about adding additional genes. And I guess that my other comment was related to, since we, we may have other genes that may be involved in some of these cases, and we have not yet discovered them, that maybe a um, genomic approach might be useful. Yeah, my diagnosis is from my mother having it, my grandfather having it. Right, so you have a clinical and, and diagnosis. some aunts. I have two children that have it. Yeah. So. so we're seeing a dominant transition, transmission. You know, so it fits in, uh, but we don't have the actual genetic change. Yeah. So that tells me that there is perhaps a, either a, a mutation in one of the other portions that we're not looking at of the sodium channel or the calcium channel. Primarily, I would say probably more likely the sodium channel. Uh, uh, and so, if we're not finding it, we can expand and just maybe do the whole gene. Uh, but we've actually done that on a number of patients that were negative and we didn't find anything. So, I think the payoff is probably pretty low. Uh, and then we start balancing the cost of doing that, uh, and, and our cost that we sometimes absorb, uh, it may be better to think about shifting to a, a more global look to see if we find it. And that's not uh, a perfect solution, but it may give us another thing to consider. And we have so many that have turned out to be negative uh, with the screen, and they obviously have something going on that, uh, and we find, we find family histories that are not too different than yours. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty sure there's a genetic disorder going on, but you just don't have that. Do we have a, maybe time for three more questions? There was one, two. No, I got one related to that. Just take a minute. Uh, in a case of familia, father, daughter, grandson, all in the same line, uh, you would still expect a get positive or negative, but if you hit the gene, you would expect to see the same mutation all the way through. Yeah, that would be. Uh, uh, incredibly most likely scenario and it's theoretically possible that there could be a two independent things happening but not one. If there was a report
request from Germany for additional medical reports. Is that still something that you would like to receive, or does that not fit in with your process? Uh, for you specifically? Yes. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 So, um, under the uh, regulatory environment that we work under, you have the right to request your medical records. And um, there's a little bit of hazy fuzziness because these are actually collected in Germany and transferred here. But we are, by transferring them here, we're assuming the um, uh, responsibility to kind of make them available for... No, I, I think that the question was if, if, if Dr. Lehmann requested additional stuff from her to his lab, are you going to request from her additional medical records in order to clarify your findings with her genes? It was requested, but then it's the program stopped. Sorry. The information was requested, but then the program stopped. Oh, I see. Okay. So I'm still, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, very possibly so. I think that we, if we go back and uh, did, was there a molecular diagnosis given to you at all? So, and to your knowledge, the screen was done completely? I, I, I don't know. I received the, I just received the letter asking for um, additional medical reports um, on okay. my EMG. So. Well, I think that's one of these that falls under a case by case basis. We just need to go and figure out what has been done. And uh, if there's any gaps in that, then we need to try to fill in and uh, take care of that. So it sounds like it was on to something maybe, and then, but I don't know. We'd have to go back and ask them. Yeah, so you have to follow up with him. Yeah, right. No, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we can follow up with him. I mean, we can try to contact Frank, who's still in contact. So, um, uh, there was... I was just going to comment on the um, whole exome sequencing. I recently read an article um, published by uh, some researchers at Baylor about um, they had a trial with an atypical um, muscle paralysis or weakness, and they ran through the, the common uh, sequencing for the calcium channel and the sodium channel for periodic paralysis, and they came up with you know not, nothing. So they did the whole exome sequencing, and they found something new in the calcium channel. So there are new ones out there. It was an R897S, okay. and um, so they conclude, you know, their conclusion was that uh, they're proposing that that whole exome sequencing is going to be probably um, cost effective in the long run yes. for these kind of patients. Uh, and there's probably a whole lot more, you know, mutations out there that seem to be identified. That's exactly why I raised the point is that I think that we kind of reached, with the screen that we have, we kind of reached an endpoint for a lot of patients with no answer. And perhaps because of costs coming down, uh, and they continue to come down, that it may be more reasonable to do an exome type of thing. Yes. I'm quite sensitive about patients that go on for years, but we see it every day in our set. It, you know, and it's frustrating for us as well as them. And now we have a tool that might be uh, a better approach. It's, again, not a perfect one, but we, uh, it may be better. Okay. Um, is, there, is there any more, like, really burning questions? Otherwise, I would like to move on. Uh, yes? Yes, please. <laughs> I, I would like to know, when you have some of these families that have huge numbers of family members, couldn't you take one and just for the heck of it, do a whole genome? I mean, maybe you would pick out somebody that would unlock the gates to all of these people. That, that's what I'm proposing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that we, had, especially in the uh, presence of a strong family history, we had someone who uh, had all the clinical and, uh, uh, presentation uh, that that might, and that's, uh, we do that on a regular basis for other disorders uh, when we kind of come to the end of our road. So, and I think especially with a strong family history, that really makes good, good sense to do. I, I think in the, uh, uh, when, when there is a lot of money to be made in, in the space of rare diseases, 
So in this, in this, in this instance, obviously, tarot has uh, a drug, and if they make a lot of money from that drug, they're very incentivized to find genetically diagnosed patients who are a very good candidate for their drug. This is straight business. So they cost 500 to screen, or if you build a better mousetrap and 1,000 to screen, but they stand to make even 50,000 or 20,000, they're still making a giant profit. So if we can get pharma, let's not put tarot on the spot per se, but uh, pharma interested in sponsoring genetic testing, it, it even pays for them to sponsor discovering a new gene. If discovering a new gene means discovering 20 new people. 20 times 100,000 is a lot of money. So, you know, I mean, so there is a win-win partnership that one could make if you're clever with in, in working with, uh, you know, industry and everyone else. So, Jason, it's actually happening. So, limb girdle muscular dystrophy costs so much money. And I was telling him it costs a big problem we have with the gene testing. But there's one pharma that is sponsoring now free genetic testing for some MDA patients with muscular dystrophy, not periodic cancer, but 35 genes for free from saliva. The thing is, their gene is also in that, and their treatment for that. So if they find one, even though they're spending money for doing so many free samples, it's enough for them to... Right. So great. I should go into business. <laughs> Does anybody have any objection to doing genomic sequencing? Is that other than... I mean, there are some limitations, but for those that are uh, conversant with the details, uh, anything that you would see that would really prevent us from going forward with, with uh, offering a strategy like that? Oh. We'd have to have a lottery. I mean, everybody in here would say yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't need to announce that. But, uh, I know exactly what the, the, the comment about how long it takes to reach a diagnosis, there's probably a lot of people sensitized to exactly that odyssey that shows up all the time. There's a lot of nice pictures here. Yeah, well, I was going to give you a travel log. <laughs> <laughs> it's like autumn, winter, autumn, yeah. summer, yeah. summer. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't quite sure where to go with this, so I was going to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a nice facility. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jeff.